and half the students stop. I'm not sure whether Mark mentioned me giving a lecture at some point or not. I usually do this uh, at the end of his slot, the first part, and then I'll explain why he came uh, this late. So I'm a lecturer in uh, what we, uh, what's called CREST, Center for Research and Evolution Search and Testing. So there's a slight hint why I'm doing this to you guys. But you might wonder uh, why is he here, because I'm, I'm actually from systems and software engineering group. So it's you know, it's a different spectrum of the department. But uh, then again, the, the, the group uh, CREST, which is part of SSE in uh, UCL, has this expertise in uh, what we call search-based software engineering. So among other things, we use GAs to solve uh, real engineering problems in software engineering. So we, we uh, do various things, including software testing, which is my area, uh, using the algorithms that you just went through. So today, I will be talking a little bit about slight uh, different flavor of GAs. Uh, the, the, the sequence is not really ideal. I mean, what would have been much better if you did this just after mouse stuff. But Anyway, I hope it's still fresh in your mind. So we'll be looking at what we call multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. And then we will also look at briefly, it kind of allows uh, some applications that we do in CREST, which is quite close. And the reason I um, that this lecture was delayed is because this guy arrived about <laughs> two weeks ago. So I had to you know, wait. And also, I, I, I get the, you know, if I talk some nonsense, it's because I'm not sleeping that much. <laughs> Oh, we're not on this, no way. <laughs> so, okay, so the topic is mainly about multi object evolutionary algorithms, uh, and then we will look at some applications. This is the outline, but yeah, let's dive in. So, the genetic algorithms that you've been looking at. Uh, one key ingredient is the fitness function. So you define your problems, uh, you, you, you're, you're sort of describing what the, best, the good solutions should uh, look like, and what, what the properties of a good solution is, and you describe it in the fitness function, and then the GA does the work for you by recombining and uh, applying the evolutionary pressure to the population. So in a way, you are looking for a solution which uh, excels in that particular fitness function, which is a single expression. If you have more than one objective, so you, you, you care about more than one thing, you know, I want my solution to be good in this, good according to this particular fitness function, but also good according to some other fitness function at the same time. So how would you watch that situation based on what you have learned so far? How would you apply your GA? Let's say you have function f1 and f2, two different functions. You want to maximize both of them? Yeah. Just maximize one and then maximize the other. Okay, that's, yeah, that's actually the existing approach. So you first maximize for f1, and then take what, that population and start maximizing for well, We already did, what, um, we did a genetic program, and um, in my one I had, so there was two parts of it. One was um, to find a solution which um, which uh, made a logic function 100% um, correct. Right. And then after that, I then um, sort, like, I had my sorting methods that um, the next stage would be to, um, yeah, to then try and reduce the number of uh, cells. So in the second stage, you will have to make sure that it's still good for the first one, and then yeah. do your second thing. Okay. So there are a range of approaches that you can take when you have more than one, uh, one objective. Uh, what you just described is you know, one particular good example of what we call classical approaches. But can you take the mean? Uh, sorry? Can you take the mean of the two errors, or the two cross functions? You can take the mean, yes. That's another uh, uh, approach that we will look at. So before that, let me introduce you a concept. Some of you might be already uh, familiar with it. Uh, mainly from the field of economy, uh, economics. So, you know, that 2080 rule that people uh, often mention, it's, called, it's from this guy called Pareto, uh, he's an Italian economist. But anyway, we, we, we have this concept of Pareto optimality. So, somewhat childish example, but let's say we have two students uh, and we have uh, exam scores. One does better in English and then the other does better in math. And the question we want to ask is, who's the better student? 
uh, in terms of academic uh, in the attitude, not, not in person, but anyway. So the, what, what we do in school is to take the mean, as you said, right? So we, we get average, and then that's the, the ranking. So if we take average, it's 70 versus 80. So you would say that that student who does better in math is better uh, overall. But then it, it gets even more childish. But uh, <laughs> if you are looking for someone who's particularly good at with language, then you would apparently uh, look at the left students, right, as a, as a, a potential employee. Whereas if you are choosing someone who will do computer science PhD, then you know doing better with math is much uh, much more ideal. So what, what I'm really saying is, if you take the average of two totally different things, then the underlying assumption is we accept that two subjects or two objectives are equally important. Right? And uh, well, with school, it's sort of natural. I mean, it's all, all the subjects are equally important. Otherwise, they will not be in the curriculum. So it makes sense. But um, in other situations, it may not be the case. So mathematically speaking, what we are doing is uh, we are weighing two objectives 50-50, uh, okay? Then we uh, are diving into what we call threat optimality. That's the guy, the Italian economist. Uh, he was initially talking about uh, the distribution of wealth in society. So this is a quote from his text. Change from one allocation of wealth to another is threat optimal if and only if that makes at least someone better off without making any other worse off. So you know, everyone should be at least the same as right now. And then if you can improve someone else's well-being, then that's a great optimal move from one allocation to the other. Thank you. OK. So I, I, I will make the slides available afterwards. So if we rephrase it uh, to our students' example, then a student from one location of marks compared to another is correct optimal if and only if he or she excels in at least one subject without being inferior in any other subjects. So let me uh, pull out a correct optimal student. So <laughs> this person is doing you know, at least as well as any other uh, in either subjects and excels in something else, right? So clearly, I mean, those two are you know, horrible choice of words, but inferior than him in terms of comparing the grades. So what we say in multi-objective optimization that the terms, those two we call are non-dominating. You cannot really say, unless you know which objective is more important than the others, they are you know, sort of uh, equal. No one dominates, neither dominates the other. Whereas this person dominates the other two because you know, however you compare, he is doing better in all objectives. So he's at least as good as the left one in English and excels in math. And he's at least as good as the right student in math and excels in English. So he's correct optimal compared to those two. Okay? You can think of it uh, for more than two objectives. So for n objectives, you, you should have at least n minus one objectives that are at least equal, and then at least one objective that the optimal one is better than all the others. Okay, does this make sense? It's not, you know, rocket science yet. <laughs> well, maybe not until the end. I mean, this is <laughs> pretty common sense if you, you know, spend some time with it. Okay, so good. What this, what the, the challenge that this brings in is if you have single fitness function, then you can always rank all the population, right? You, know, you, just, you just sort the entire population according to the fitness. But if we start having uh, non-dominating pairs, or even more than pairs, you know, multiple solutions that are not dominating each other, then how do you, you know, rank them? If you have to choose from you know, five candidate solutions that are not dominating each other, then you know, whom to choose? That's the uh, big question. Because if we want to optimize, if we, if we want to apply GA based on that concept, then we need to, you know, at some point, choose. You either need to do the select selection operator, or eventually you also have to uh, report a solution, which will not be a single one, because you know the best ones may be not just one, but two or three non-dominating solutions. So with single objective, it's easy. You sort the population uh, according to the fitness, and then pick the best one. 
now we may not have a single best solution because there is this concept of non-dominating pairs. So we will be reporting multiple solutions in the end. So the end product of this Pareto-based optimization, we call them Pareto fronts. Uh, you see visually why we call them fronts. So as a result, what we get out of the multi-objective optimization is not a single solution, but a set of non-dominated solutions. You cannot have a dominated one as your solution because then something that dominates it should be actually in the solution, right? Because there's apparently a correct optimal one in the population. So if you pick only the best, and by best I mean you know, no other solution in the uh, population will dominate them, then that's your end result, and we call them threats or fronts. The true threats or fronts, meaning you know, if you really know all possible solutions in your search space, and then pick your threats or fronts out of those, then the true pressure fronts represents the real trade-offs between the objectives. So you know, what's possible with this object against what's possible with the other objective and then the exact trade-off because you have considered everything in the search space, which is usually not feasible. So with real-world application, then uh, we do not know what the true pressure front is. Sort of similar to you know, complex GA problems where you do not know what the global optimum is. So, uh, yeah, another analogy is if we used to have the global optimum, which is a single solution that dominates the entire search space, now we have true press to front, which is still multiple solutions, but then dominates the entire search space in terms of press optimality. That's the single multiple uh, analogy. This is why we call them press to front. So let's say we are maximizing objective one and two, then all these solutions are not dominated by uh, others. And we will call them non-dominated level one. And because they sort of form this outer layer of your existing population, that's why we sort of use the expression front. And then if you take away the outer layer, then we can uh, choose the next level of non-dominated solution. And finally, the sort of uh, that, that leaves uh, two solutions that are not doing that well. Okay. Uh, if you take three objectives, then the fronts will be actually a surface. If you go above three, then you cannot really visualize it, but it's sort of hypersurface in the high dimension of space that's not dominated by any other solutions. So, now we know what uh, what sort of uh, dominance concept in basically what you have defined is which solution is better than the other solution. Given two solutions, if you are sing doing single objective optimization, you just compare the fitness value. If you are doing multi objective uh, optimization, you first see whether there's any Pareto dominance relation. If not, they are non dominating. So any comparisons, for example, to apply the selection operator, should be based on Pareto optimality. So if one solution dominates the other, then we select that. A good result, uh, result of the optimization, should be as close to the true pressure front as possible. But because we do not know the true pressure front, this is generally not really exactly measurable. And also, what we want to uh, achieve is as uh, a front that's as uniformly distributed as possible. Um, behind the... Oh, okay. yeah. So if that's your search space and you want to maximize on both objectives, even if you have maximized both objectives quite well, if, you, if your end result is just that, you, know, you do not get that much choice out of it. Right? You're not really seeing any trade-off between two objectives. You just know that you might as well treat all four of them as an identical solution. But suppose, instead of this, Slightly inferior in terms of breadth of melody, but you get another front that looks like this. So compared to this, that tells you much more about what your problem is about, how these two objectives are interacting in terms of a trade-off. So 
sometimes you would want not only the, the, the closeness to the true pressure front because you can say that although this is very uh, narrow, this is closer to the true pressure front because it has pushed both objectives much further away. But then this is much wider and, and in other words, this reflects the trade-off of between two objectives much better than this solution. So there are times when you want this, even though this is not really uh, as optimal as the narrow fronts. So those two concepts are most of what, what most of the multi-objective algorithms sort of strive for. So there are many, many, many variations. In fact, each year, if you go to the main conference, you get about a dozen new ones, I guess. Uh, but really, what they are trying to achieve is convergence, meaning you know, pushing this the furthest away possible, and then diversity, meaning uh, getting the widest possible fronts out of your such space. Okay, so now we know what the first optimal uh, relationship is, and then we also know what the implication for optimization is. But in, in somewhat bizarre turn of events, I will go back to really non Brett optimal classical method. Maybe I should reorder the slides. So this is how people dealt with multiple objectives before uh, this whole Brett optimal multi objective evolutionary algorithm. So um, I'll just go through the, the two of them, weighted sum and uh, epsilon constraint method. All these classical method assumes that we have a single objective solver. It doesn't even have to be GA, but we, we have some solver, so we might do exact method with integer linear programming, etc., etc. But given that we have a single objective problem solver, we will now use that to deal with multiple objectives. First, weighted sum. So this is really you know, combining all the objectives with different ways. And this is what you described as uh, mean, basically. Mean is uh, equal weights for every objective. If you have enough domain knowledge that, uh, so that you can say this objective is twice important as the other one, then you can actually tweak the weights and um, not go for the actual uh, average or mean. There are clear advantages. It's quite simple, very intuitive. Uh, it's what anyone will you know, sort of jump at as a first conclusion. And if your solution space is convex, then there is a guarantee that this will find all solutions, although it may take some time. How? OK, let's say we have, again, two objectives, and that's your feasible solution space. And now I think we want to minimize. Therefore, our uh, solution front is convex to the minimization direction, right? Once you introduce some weight, you can actually uh, draw the tangent to the solution space based on the relative uh, weighting. Okay. And then what you do with your single um, objective solver is trying to bring that line until it just touches the solution front on this side because you're minimizing it. So that gives you one solution. So to, to yeah. find this um, this line, is there like a kind of linear regression to find which is the best? Well, for that line, I mean, no, this, the, this, the, yeah, the this tangent one. of this line. No, it, we, uh, no, there's no given solution. Mainly because, OK, so in this case, if we forget about weighting some approach and just look at this as a pure multi-objective optimization, then what's our true pressure front? This is that bit, right? Mm -hmm. the, the outer uh, line of this globe thingy. Um, either you try various combinations of W1 and W2 so that you will get all uh, dots on that Pareto front. Or there is some external domain knowledge that tells you W1 and W2 should be this. Therefore, only a single solution out of this blob is important to me. It's those two. Um, because, you know, Choosing W1 and W2 means that you are shooting for certain direction within this flow, right? So unless you know where to where you want to shoot for, there's no real sort of clear way to determining 
W and W. So in, in a way, you know, choosing your weights sort of choose your solution as well out of the such things. Okay, so you don't know the, the weight before? No. no. So it's either what, what you care for uh, in your problem domain, not, not in optimization. Or you have to just try lots of things to, yeah. to see so, you know, what the shape is like. So if you try uh, a couple of pairs of W1 and W2 with this, then you will end up with some different parts of this Jupiter mm. front, and then you will get some idea of, okay, what, what, what does it look like, sort of thing. And it is actually, uh, if you just want sort of quick and dirty approximation of your Jupiter front, then it's quite good, because single uh, objective solvers are generally much faster than multi-objective ones. So if you just try a couple of weights, Different weights and, and look at uh, end up in different positions, uh, different uh, locations along the first front, and it gives you some ideas about what the trend of is like. So far, so good. What are the distances? Uh, we cannot really mix minimization and maximization if you are uh, have more, uh, doing weighted sum approach because, uh, so is it clear from the picture? Intuitively, you cannot mix those two, otherwise you can't really push this line to one direction. Right? You are either pushing this way or that way. Uh, mixing, minimizing and maximizing combined will be sort of a turning the line at the same time you're trying to move in through the block so it doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, there's no method known that allows you to determine the weights effectively. And then, if it's non-convex, then you, know, you will miss some solution. So however you treat the weights, you will always end up with either this point or that point. No way you can reach those. Because whenever you, whenever line touches there, the line will be also across this other two regions, and then there's scope for driving it down. That part is unreachable with weighted some approach. Okay, questions? Okay. Slightly smarter approach is epsilon constraint. So this time we will focus on one one objective and solve for that objective, but turn everything else into constraint. So pick one fitness function out of your multiple ones and minimize or maximize that. But then everything else should be within that uh, epsilon constraint. Therefore, the name. How does it work? You can see that it now deals with non convex problems as well. So, first pick small epsilon constraint region and then try to minimize objective one only. Okay, and then you reach there. Then we increase the epsilon slightly more, and then so now we are only looking at this part and then minimize so we get that part. Okay. And then another epsilon, and then now another solution. So if you do this with very fine uh, grained constraint grids, then you can sort of uh, solve the non convex vector points as well. So advantage hopes with non convex vector space. Disadvantage it's really how you uh, pick the, the, the epsilon value that decide which part of the front it can obtain. So in this example, because epsilon 3 is sort of slightly wider than 1 and 2, we are now skipping that part and we now include this part. Therefore, what epsilon 3 means that this not somewhere here, right? So how you increase your constraint window uh, sort of determines where you can find the solution. And of course, there is no way to tell you know, which epsilon value you should use before you know the entire uh, such space. And then also, the higher the dimension, the more input the human needs to provide. Meaning, for each uh, additional fitness that you have converted into constraint, you also need to pick the epsilon value as well. So, for two objectives, then it's just okay, pick one and uh, another one epsilon value for constraint. If it's three, then you need to pick two. Three, four, it increases. So for higher dimensionality, uh, more work for the humans to do. There are more. Uh, some of them is actually 
what we call sequential method. So you uh, optimize for one objective and then keep it as a constraint and then move on to the second objective and then keep the results so far as a, another constraint and then move on to third, etc. So that's what you have described before. And, and some other uh, complex methods. And we call them classical in a sense that uh, this is what people used to do around the well, Second World War, basically, uh, operations research type uh, problem solving. And then these multi-objective GAs are actually quite recent. Um, so that's the classical method. Now we will dive into the real deal. Interesting so far. It's not that hard. Yeah, again. This is one of the most popular uh, what's objective evolution algorithm out there right now. And uh, the guy who, who wrote it, who, who developed it, is you know, sort of hugely popular and he's doing consultancy all over the world, I think. Um, with many, many different domains. So it's called NSJ2. Uh, NSJ stands for non dominated sorting genetic algorithm. This is actually version two of his algorithm. He used to have NSJ. And then uh, I met him this September, and he says NSJ3 is coming <laughs> quite soon to, to deal with some high dimensionality uh, challenges. It's like movie sequels, maybe. Really, but he's quite proud of it, so let's see. So it, the algorithm does what, we, what, what, what he calls non dominated sorting in all M and square complexity. M is number of objectives, N is the population size. It's not really linear, but you know, it's, it's a, sort of okay, I, I think. I mean, because you do not really pick that massively large uh, population size. Um, there is a concept called crowding distance, which is quite smart. And then I think elitism has featured in normal series, right? So the best solutions always get carried away to the next generation. These are the sort of ingredients that goes into NSJ2. So the key, key, key concept is this non-dominated sorting, which is actually in the title of the algorithm. I would not really require you to pass through the pseudocode, but the, I mean, it, it's enough to go through the comments. So. Okay, that's, I think that's, no, no, no. So that's some, some temporary outside. So each Q in our population, if another solution P, oh no, okay, so each, each, sorry, each solution P in our population, and then we compare it to each other solution in the population, if P dominates Q, then Q is a, Q added to the set of solutions dominated by P. So SP is the list of other solutions that P dominates. Okay? Otherwise, if Q dominates P, then uh, domination counter of P gets increased. So after we went go through this, this loop, if NP is e zero, which means no other solution has dominated P, right? So then P belongs to the first front. The, remember the, the front level that we discussed? So P's rank becomes one, and then the front one gets added P, right? And then you increase the front counter. And what's the second? Oh, and then for, for all the solutions that was dominated by P, we Oh, and then we, uh, for all the solutions that we have assigned to the outermost current front, we look at the solutions that were dominated by them, and then increase, I mean, decrease the domination count because we have dealt with the outermost front. And then if they, non, if they, if they get uh, non-dominated, once we uh, leave out the first layer, then we assign them to the second layer, and then that becomes the next front, and then we go on. So we sort of peel layer by layer and, and go to the uh, go, go deeper and deeper. There is a plot that will help you later. 
And why is it uh, m n squared? Because we have this double loop for the population, the entire population. So that's n squared. And then uh, we want to make comparisons for whenever we do this, uh, we do comparisons for each objective to check the predominant. So that's the m. So hence the complexity of m n squared. So that's fast non dominated sort. Yeah. Even though it was, yeah. It goes from in to out, or yeah. it, it goes from the outer layer to in, to mm -hmm. inwards. So it picks the best layer first, and then move on to the next and the next. On, on the outer layer is a Pareto problem. Yeah, currently in in the current population, the outermost layer is the uh, Pareto optimal front. And, and why it goes to uh, since uh, we have the optimal? Yeah, problem. we'll we'll get to that. Hold that so. So another concept introduced by NSJ2 is uh, crowding distance, or a particular definition of it. Okay, so suppose we have these solutions right now. We are maximizing on both objectives. If you have to discard one, which would you choose? Show hands. So <laughs> that one. That one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Why? There are many others on the many others. Yeah, exactly. So that's to preserve which concept that we talked about earlier? <coughs> MOEA is stripe for convergence and diversity, and, and this is really to preserve diversity. So out of this, if you discard that one or that one, you would so diversity plummets. Mm -hmm. So we really want to uh, discard something out of these three, I think. So how do you measure that exactly? Oh. I even had uh, animation. So out <laughs> between A and B, you really want to discard B. So uh, NSJ2 defines that concept into a crowding distance. So a solution that's farther away from the others is rarer and therefore more valuable. So we want to keep that. So this is how we define a uh, crowding distance for solution I. So the I1 and IN. Oh, first, before we go into these equations, first we pick one objective and sort entire population according to that particular objective, right? And then I1 and IN means mm -hmm. the solutions at the end according to that particular objective, right? So they are the extreme points, therefore they are the most valuable, so they always get uh, the highest crowding distance. And everything else is normalized sort of cuboid. Maybe this is a bit better. Okay, so I think this is taken from his paper. So I think we are minimizing on F1 and F2. Uh, what I meant by the extreme points is this solution and that solution, right? They are the, at the very end according to either F1 or F2. Therefore, they always get the highest crowding distance, which is the infinite. And then for solution I, the crowding distance is the normalized length of these two sides combined. So the distance for i is i, I in, in one dimension according to f1 is between the just previous solution according to f1 and the right after the right next solution according to f1. The length of that. Okay? And then according to f2, again just the previous solution and the next solution, so length is this. And then we normalize it uh, based on the minimum and maximum value we have seen so far. And that gives you so the, how crowded that region is. So if everything is equal, then how would you pick? Uh, you want to pick the solution that has higher crowding distance, because that means it's farther away from other solutions. So it's rarer and it's more diversity for you. So now we have two things computed for each solution. First one is non-domination rank. We started with the best rank and then moved inwards. And then we calculate crowded distance. So now we can define a partial order in the population. So that if the rank is higher, the rank of i is higher than j, then i, I, is, better than, uh, I is better than j. Or if the rank is equal, 
and then i's crowding distance is higher than j, then again i is better than j. So with this partial order, now I'm coming back to your question, why do we even care about the second or other ranks? Okay, see, let's see. This was our current population, and then we have generated our, uh, our offsprings, which is QT. And then we do the non-dominated sorting, and this is our first outermost layer in layer in current generation, followed by the second layer, third layer. This is mix mixture of uh, parents and children, but domain, uh, sorted by that algorithm that we saw earlier. Okay, and then add crowding distance, which gives us partial ordering, and then we will now cut out our next generation of populations, right? So. F1, because we do the elitism, the best ones always goes in, right? F2 can fit in. When we try to fit F3, it doesn't fit into our population size, right? So this is where we introduce the partial order and then cut it off. But so if we uh, run the algorithm only one generation and then uh, the non dominated sorting gives you the outermost layer, then that's fine, that's your solution. But if we want to keep going and then the third outermost uh, non dominant is so, uh, rank of one is not you know, big enough, then we want to know what the next and the third ones are so that we can fill the next, uh, next generation. Right? So how does NSJ2 uh, deals with uh, convergence and diversity? Convergence is dealt with by doing this non dominant sorting and solution that uh, what's the word? Solutions that are pushing the objectives the hardest, let's say, always get uh, get carried on to the next generation. That's how uh, NSJ2 achieves convergence. Whereas the diversity is whenever we have to cut out, the partial order includes crowding distance, which tells you what the rarer, uh, more diverse solutions are. Therefore, we try to preserve. Um, those solutions rather than you know, solutions that are quite common or similar to each other already. Okay. So that's NSJ2. It's uh, again quite popular, maybe perhaps because the concepts are you know, very intuitive. So non dominant sorting is quite straightforward, and then carving distance is really, really intuitive in terms of understanding how you pick the error solutions. And it has been applied to everywhere, I think. Um, so more traditional engineering like chemicals and stuff to uh, software engineering. Uh, you will see applications if we have time near the end of the lecture. But I think we can have a 10 minute break. Right, so let's see you back by me.